I couldn't believe it. My whole entire life, not once had I ever heard this story. Nobody had preached on it. If it, if it was read to me, I don't remember it. I feel like this one it has been skipped over. Hey everyone, welcome to Joel Reads Bible. I'm Joel and uh, I'm reading the Bible, but this isn't your typical episode where I just read a chapter of the Bible. I'm actually here to recap uh, Genesis chapter 1 to 15. I think it might be good to do these types of recap videos just to sort of maybe respond to some of the comments I've gotten or if I've learned something since I did the initial video, uh, or when I read further, it, it brings light to a, a previous chapter. Uh, this is the place to sort of go like, hey, this is extra information uh, that goes beyond what I said when I initially read it. So this is the recap for Genesis chapter 1 to 15. Genesis chapter 1 was pretty straightforward. It, it, it started off nicely with the creation account. There was a problem that I didn't notice, which is that God created days on day one, and then on day four, he created the sun and the moon, which is the way we know what days are. Like, that is what a day, that's what indicates days. But the, the point when you look at something like Genesis 1, and one of the comments that I got on that video was, it's poetic. And it is very poetic. And it's not literal. And I think that that's what a lot of this is going to end up being, which is, you can't take it literally or even almost seriously. And in this case, uh, why would you ever reject scientific discovery in place of a non-literal, poetic, obviously, if you wanted to take it literally, flawed account of the beginning of our universe? Next up, we had chapter two, which opens with a blatant contradiction because in chapter one, vegetation was made on day three. Um, and I mentioned this, I think, when I did the episode. But in, you know, the second chapter, man was created, it seems, before day three. And then there was a whole episode where Adam had uh, animals pass before him. And he was looking for a helper but he couldn't find a suitable one, and then also ended up naming them. And then God decided to make Eve. Even though in chapter 1, it says in verse 27, male and female, he created them, making it seem like he created both male and female on the same day, uh, which was day 6. But then in the second chapter, unless day 6 was a really long day, where he made all the animals, made man, then had all the animals prayed past the man. The man named all the animals. And then he put him to sleep, put him for some reason God needed to give him anesthetic. He was asleep, removed a rib because for some reason God was running out of <laughs> stuff like material matter. We, I need, uh, what can I use? Hey, I got to take something off you. There's no more dirt and dust. You know, we're, we're dust, you know. And it's just crazy to think, because he booped everything else into existence, but for some reason he couldn't boop Eve into existence. Obviously, again, poetic. I do want to mention that a lot of Christians use that passage of uh, God taking the rib, saying, hey, see, look, men and women, equal, equal. See, she's, he, he, she, Adam is, the, it's the side. It's not, you know, it didn't take it from his feet bone. You know, didn't take it from his head bone, you know, get, took it from the middle. So they're actually partners. I mean, first of all, she's his helper. I don't know if helper is always below you. Okay, fine. But in the next chapter, God's going to curse women by making men rule over them. And, and then if you just read read the rest, just all you got to do is read the rest. You know, it, you know, it's not explicit, but it's pretty pretty loudly implicit that God doesn't care about women and they are property and they are second. <laughs> I don't even know if they're second to men. I feel like camels are second or something. 
So then we have what is colloquially known as the fall of man. And I don't know where in the Bible that is found, that idea. Um, it'll be interesting to see going forward. I have always heard that you know, when Eve took a bite of the apple, sin entered the world. That was not what was said in that chapter. So I don't know if that does come up somewhere else. Like th that, that may be in one of the other books. It says, and sin entered the world when the woman ate the... But in the chapter, it says that the Adam and Eve, or, or Eve, noticed that if I eat the fruit, I'll get wisdom... Uh, the only person that seems to be lying in the chapter is, of course, God. The serpent says, you'll, your eyes will be opened. You know, you'll, you'll be like God in the sense that you'll know good and evil. You'll have that knowledge. And that's true. As soon as she eats it, that happens. God says, you will surely die uh, as soon as you eat the fruit. As soon as they eat it, they do not die. And, okay, it's maybe metaphorical. But is it? You know, is it really? Because then we get the idea that there's a tree of life in the garden and God blocks them off from the tree of life. So is all of this actually literal? Is, is, is the punishment, one of the extra punishments, there's a, there's a bit of a list, you will not be able to eat of this fruit, you will not be able to live forever now. Does anybody, does anyone, does any fundamentalist Christian believe literally, that there is a tree of life somewhere on this planet, or that there was a tree of life somewhere on this planet, does any f Christian anywhere literally buy that? Or do they, do they go, oh, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, true, like that, I believe. But yeah, obviously there's not a tree of life. There's obviously not a, a, a tree with fruit that if you eat it, you'll live forever, if that's even what it is. It doesn't go into great detail. But I think we can all see, oh, that, yeah, that's a fairy tale. Oh, that's a myth. Oh, the, but the rest of it definitely happened. And then we come to chapter four, which is the Cain and Abel, uh, the first murder, uh, first brothers kill each other, family values. And in the episode, I said that Cain had mental health issues. That's just because I was doing the math on the story, right? Cain wants to find favor with God. He's actually mad because Abel has found favor. God goes, hey, you could do it right. You could, if you know how to do it, you know how to do the offerings correctly. And he decides to find favor with God. The best thing for him to do in his mind is to kill Abel, right? Anybody, any idiot could go, well, no, do the offering thing better. Like do... Figure out what God wants and make him happy. If you want this God to love you and, and think you're great, do it, do, why don't you do that? You know, but he doesn't. He kills his brother to find favor. And then another indicator that he actually wants God to love him and, and wants to find favor with God is he goes, God, I, I can't bear to be taken out of your sight. I, th this is, it'll be too much for me to bear. So I guessed... This was all like, it was a crime of passion uh, or and, and or a mental health issue. Because that's the only thing that made reasonable sense to me. Or the other thing that could make sense is that it's a fictional story that is poorly written. Where the motivation of the character doesn't make any sense. Because whoever wrote it was probably somewhat illiterate and didn't really fully understand how to properly, you know, tell a logical story where the characters are correctly motivated. I mean, nowadays, if somebody, someone were to write that into a script, they would look at it and, and the, the, the editor would go, I'm sorry, that, why would he kill the guy? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand the character's motivation. Oh, he has mental health issues. Okay, all right. Well, you should really show that previously in the story. And when I was initially told that story, and when you hear these stories, or, or even some of the comments I got on the story, there was a lot of uh, inferring as to what it was that Cain was doing wrong and Cain's attitude, and even that Cain was lying when he said it would be too much for him to bear to be out of God's sight. None of that is based in the text because it says that 
Cain brought fruits and vegetables, but Abel brought fatty animals and the, the, the you know the the firstborn or something like obviously Abel's uh, offering was better and God liked it more, but it doesn't say that it's because Cain's offering was half-assed or he gave his seconds. It doesn't say that. God does say, you know what is right. So we can kind of assume that Cain isn't doing what is right, but that's it. We, we can't assume it was a heart issue. We can't assume that. But notice we're here in chapter four and already in every chapter, there's a problem. There's something we have to work through for it to make sense. There's almost an apologetic needed for every single chapter. Genesis chapter 5 was boring, nothing to see here, uh, just a really dull episode. But go back and watch it. There's a couple of good jokes. But then in chapter 6, that's when things really start kicking off and getting weird. When I read the chapter, I saw the Nephilim and uh, children of God and daughters of man. And I was very confused at what's going on there. But the algorithm, all hail the algorithm, brought me a bunch of information that I barely even asked for. So I learned about the Nephilim, which were actually children born of angels who had come down to sleep with very attractive human women. And uh, this is told in more detail in the book of Enoch, which if I can get through this uh, series, which is probably going to take me 11 years, um, I, will, I would like to read the book of Enoch. But this is wild. The book of Enoch, of course, not treated as canon. It was not, it's not part of the Bible, probably because if you read it, uh, it's a, it's, it's such a mythical thing. It's over the top. These angels came down. They, uh, I believe they were called the watchers. They were, uh, stationed all over the earth and they found, uh, human women so beautiful. They had to sleep with them. They made the super race. They were giants. They were called the Nephilim. The Nephilim got really violent, way out of hand, and God had to destroy the earth. Because of the Nephilim, it wasn't even that people were so horrible. It was the Nephilim. I just glanced at the book of Enoch and I noticed that, you know, the angels were teaching human people uh, the ways, magical ways of plants and different magical things of heaven and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, there's so much stuff here that nobody here in this day and age would think, oh yeah, this is definitely 100% absolute truth, fact. You know, you'd go, oh, this is mythical and it's fantastical. But bits and pieces of that is in the Bible. So how do you take it? It's part of the same world. It's part of the same story. It's the literal same story. Why would they leave in sons of God and then daughters of man and then Nephilim? It's in there. Unless the Bible left in some wacky, mythical stuff just for fun, but it's not real, I would say that the whole thing is a myth. The whole thing is legend. And it's probably a good idea just to think of it that way. It's just wild to me that fully grown adults can look at that kind of stuff. Like, we, we all look at the Greek myths and we go, yeah, 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 that's... <laughs> Not true, you know what I mean? But this this Hebrew myth, all of a sudden it's like, no, that one, yeah, no angels came down and uh, thought human women were hot. So then we go to chapter seven, and in chapter seven it opens with another blatant contradiction that I don't know how anyone's supposed to apologetic their way out of this. It starts off by saying that Noah actually took seven pairs of each clean animal and seven pairs of each bird. So that's 14 of each, as opposed to the everywhere else mentioned two of a kind. Why is nobody proofreading this? You know, it's just a dumb mistake. How is it in there? You didn't think that that would trip people up? And at the time I did mention that there's way too much water on the planet when, when the flood was, you know, just when they were sitting there for the 150 days, 
There was so much water on that planet, there's no way it's still here. It's just too much water, okay? So there had to be a supernatural element to get the water off the planet, blow it off. Well, the wind came and blew it off. And where did it go? Nobody knows. And also, as it went down, everything just grew back right away. That's supernatural. So why on earth do creationists bother to look for evidence anywhere for a flood? If it did happen, if this story is true, it's absolutely ridiculous. It couldn't happen naturally. It had to have been supernatural. Just believe it's completely supernatural. Just believe that all the like fossil record, none of it, none of the, the uh, rock formation, none of this stuff is due to the flood. The flood was a supernatural thing that killed the angel, super angel giant people. And then God disappeared the water, grew everything back real fast. And then everyone got off the boat and they were fine. So stop looking for natural evidence and going, ha ha, it was the flood. Let it go. Just go, I believe in a supernatural flood that's natural, that just couldn't happen but God can make it happen. And he did this crazy supernatural thing, left no evidence. The evidence would be there's 20, 20 feet above the highest mountain, and you got to think that that's a whole globe worth of water. Now it's like inside the thing. It's, part, it's the oceans, but it's also like inside the planet. There's that much. I don't know if it was salt water, but there's that much water still on or in this planet. So then in chapter eight, uh, that's when all the water starts going away. I kind of ranted about that two seconds ago. But the thing that I didn't mention in chapter eight was that Noah took some of all the clean animals and sacrificed them to God. And, you know, I thought it was funny that, you know, God just liked the smell of the burnt flesh like a bit. Hey, you guys, barbecue. I love barbecue. You guys, we're doing barbecue. Okay, you know what? I forgive it. You know, I thought that was funny. But what I didn't think of was, if there were two of every clean animal, what are you doing killing some of them? Like, which ones? Which, the, which, who, which, which female partner or male partner is dying? You know, like, what are you doing? Killing, wait, like, okay, if there's 14, if that number is correct, then you have a few more, but, but let them procreate for a while first. Why are you taking some of the clean ones? Take, take some of the unclean ones. Of course, God doesn't want that as a sacrifice. Just, you know, wait for a while so that they can repopulate and then start killing them for God. I mean, how, how does that make any sense? And again, we're here at chapter 8, and it's just been problem after problem after problem. If you take it literally, you don't have to take it literally. You can call it you don't even want to call it a myth. You want to call it truth, but it's stories, but it obviously didn't really happen or it's supernatural. So God can do things that like people can't, whatever you want to say, but you try to not take it literally, but you still have to contend with an incredibly violent, short-sighted God because he's going to kill everyone. He's going to kill everyone you have to ask the question, why did God let his horny, horny angels patrol the world to make the superhuman race that was going to be evil? But also, you know, why did he bother creating this people, humans, who every inclination of their heart is, is evil? Every, every, every. I will, I will spare you guys, and you guys can continue, even though every inclination of your heart is evil. Why have you made them? Why have you made these purely evil beings? And don't tell me that it was the fall, because at this point, there's no indicator that eating the fruit made every inclination of their hearts evil. It's not in the text. You can infer that if you want, and maybe it is in the book later. There's a lot left, <laughs> but it's not in the text yet. You know, you think chapter 9 is going to be nice because it's the one where God does the rainbows and the promises. And I'm never going to hurt you, babies. I'm never going to hurt my little babies again. 
that happened one time, but you really made me mad. And by the way, I've gotten rid of the superhumans. Now it's just the humans, so it should be fine. But then it gets weird at the end because after some boring names again, we see Noah, mm, by the way, the best guy, the best one God could keep, gets a vineyard, too much wine, gets drunk, and passes out completely nude, just splayed there. And I don't have to retell the story that much. But, of course, Ham comes in, sees him naked, and that's not a choice, by the way. He just, oh, oh, jeez. And then goes out, tells his brothers, his brothers go in and, and cover him. There's nothing more to that story. And then Noah wakes up and goes, oh my goodness. I, he suddenly realizes, I don't know how, maybe he, when he was sleeping in a drunken stupor, he actually saw what was happening or something. But he's like, hey, Ham was the one that saw me. And he says, this is what Ham did to me. But, he, but what, he did that to you? What did he do to you? Accidentally walk in when you were an idiot? Some people say Ham mocked his dad. It's not there. I don't see that there. And even if he did, isn't that kind of juvenile to curse him? By the way, and that's what happens. He curses, but he doesn't curse Ham. And I, don't, I think I might have said this wrong in, in the episode. He curses Canaan. He curses Ham's son. What? Why? And Noah does the curse. How is a person doing a curse? And then God enacts it through the people of Israel. This is justice, by the way. Just, and you, you will notice a lot of times when we go, God is just. The reason why we have the, the sacrifice, I've heard this before. The reason why there is Jesus and the wages of sin and, is because God is just. There needs to be a, a consequence for that. But he has mercy, so that's why Jesus came. Is God just? Is God just? To, to allow this kind of, like, this curse on Canaan because Canaan's dad saw his dad naked because his dad chose to get drunk? That's biblical justice? So in chapter 10, there's another list of names. It's not that interesting, so we can move on to chapter 11. And chapter 11 is basically the story of the Tower of Babel. And I don't know if there's a retelling of it, but I always heard that they were trying to build a tower to heaven. But that doesn't, it didn't read that way to me. And, and it, it could be semantics, but it seemed like they wanted to make a skyscraper, to a, a tower to the heavens. God saw that where they were doing and was like, uh-oh, if they can accomplish this together, they can accomplish anything. And conveniently, in that sort of monologue, he goes, and then they will not be scattered everywhere. Let's uh, change their languages, and then they get scattered, okay? It, it seems obvious that it's a, a sort of a mythical story of how languages uh, came to be and how many different races came to be all over the world. Like, I'd be surprised. And if you're a Christian watching this, let me know in the comments, do you take this one literally? Do you believe that this is a literal account? Like, this is how languages came to be. I, when I was younger and we heard this story, like, it never seemed to be sold to me as, this is actually true. It was always just like, oh, this one, this one's a story. It almost felt like it wasn't part of the Bible. So why is it that the Noah account, people are fighting tooth and nail to be like, it happened. So then chapter 12 was a big one for me. It really stopped me in my tracks. I couldn't believe it. My whole entire life, not once had I ever heard this story. Nobody had preached on it. We had never read it. I don't think... I, if, it, if it was read to me, I don't remember it. I feel like this one it has been skipped over. And I would love it if there is a pastor anywhere to honestly preach on this story. I don't know what you could do with it. I don't know what you could extrapolate from it. I don't know how you can get away from it. Watch episode 12, but I'll do a little bit of a recap here. Basically, Abram lies about his wife, Sarai, being his wife. 
because she's so hot. This is during a famine and he goes to stop in at, at Egypt. He's pretty sure that they'll kill him and take her. He goes, let's call you my sister. This results in Pharaoh taking her and marrying her, which I think they just is a, is a euphemism for having sex with her. People, when they got married, they were just having sex. Like, I, there's, there's never, a, and they said their vows, and she wore, like, that never happens. It's just like, I married her. She came into my court, and then I married her. You just banged her, right? And then Pharaoh gives Abram all sorts of great stuff. Cattle, sheep, people, camels, <laughs> in that order, possibly. You know, people are not, People are not first, and they're also not last. They're, they're somewhere in the middle, just, uh, just other property. But it's so obvious that Abram pimped his wife. He lied and pimped his wife. He lied and pimped his wife. Never forget that Abram, who later on God will say, you've kept my commands and my decrees. Basically, you're a righteous man. He's lied and pimped his wife. So I want to hear a sermon on it. If there's, if you set, give me a link. If, is there someone who's preached on this honestly and, and done it from the text? Don't infer a bunch of BS, okay? And don't tell me that just because she's his half-sister, it's just a half-lie or something like that, you know, which is something he pulls later with Abimelech, and we'll get to that. What's the, what's the apologetic spin on this one? What's the, what's the, well, God didn't tell him to do that. God didn't condone it. Like, it's, this is a, a, a dispassionate telling of something that just happened. And it's the star of the show. And he's righteous. He's good. He's not wicked. We know he's not wicked because he's got the whole covenant thing and everything goes well for him. What are you talking about? Maybe God believes that sex work is work. So in chapter 13... This is turning out to be a long episode. In chapter 13, Abraham and his brother Lot part company. Not a big deal there. They're both very, very rich, so they both need a lot of land. Obviously, Abram's rich because he's a pimp. Uh, there's a lot of money in whoring your wife out, apparently. So they part ways. And then in chapter 14, Abram is so rich that he can actually take his men, get them together, and go off and defeat multiple armies at once. Like kings with four, four kings worth of armies, Abram's household k kills him pretty quickly. Like no big deal. He also saves Lot and Sodom because they're kind of together. Uh, he won't accept anything from Sodom. There's already that now. I'm too good for this. I've made a vow. You're dirty. You're filthy. I, I don't want anyone to say that I got money off of Sodom. So he's, he's righteous. He'll pimp his wife, but he's righteous. But we are setting up Sodom to knock him down because uh, God has a plan for him, and it's not good. There, that, that's part of it, right? Where it's like, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm not going to accept a gift from you because that's not going to look good later. So we already know what's coming, which is probably because there was one guy who wrote this and uh, wrote it all at one time, and it was way in the future. And this is all fictional. <laughs> But notice, again, problem, problem, problem. How are you answering to all the problems in chapter 1 to 15? Why, are, why, why, are you, why aren't you giving up? Why are you reading one, chapter 1 to 15 of your master book and not going, yeah, it's not, this isn't, this isn't absolute truth. This is, this is a fiction. This is a fiction, and, and this God character is not good. So in chapter 15, there's some weird issues. Um, one of the ones that I sort of like glossed over because I was just confused by it was that the word of the Lord comes to Abram in a vision and then the word takes him outside? Like, is he a, is he a bit of a person? Like, the word of the Lord came to him and then the word takes him outside you know the word makes you think that it's just words but i just don't know how a word brings someone outside like the angel of the lord that would make sense but then he tells abram to get three mammals and two birds that's that's the full instructions and listen to the episode then abram does what i think we can only describe as 
what, if somebody were to do it now, was a satanic ritual. It was brutal, bloody. I don't know how he sawed up these animals, but he cut the animals in half and put them out, you know, fought off birds of prey and blood everywhere. Just, it seemed bizarre, you know, just simply bizarre. If somebody did that today on their front lawn, you'd go, oh, they need psychiatric help. Christians would be like, yeah, did you hear about what happened? You know, this guy cut up all these animals. I think, yeah, it's a heart issue. They need Christ. Some sort of spiritual warfare. They were, they were definitely doing some sort of sacrifice to Satan. It must have been, you know, no, but this is Abram, this, one of the stars of the show. Then Abram goes to sleep and it says he had like this heavy darkness upon him. Yeah, probably. You just cut up three animals. You just killed two birds. You're killing animals. I don't know if you guys have ever killed an animal. Like, I've hit a squirrel on the road. I feel terrible. I have a hard time cleaning a mouse trap. I Killing an animal isn't easy. I don't think I could saw up, and I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian, but I don't think I could saw up an animal and not go to bed feeling a little heavy. And then while Abraham's sleeping, God has this smoking pot with a torch in it sort of show up and, and move in between the animals and all the entrails. But Abraham's sleeping. Does he even see this? Does this happen in a dream? It seems to happen in real life. Abraham's in bed. But God's doing this magic trick going, hey, now do you believe that I'll have, give you a lot of descendants? Now do you buy it? It's like, What's, what's happening in this narrative? This is nothing more than superstitious nonsense. A, a weird, barbaric, mythical legend that a, a, the, a certain people group, years and years, they're ancient, came up with. And this is a thought that I had, and I'll close with this idea. If you imagine that this what, what we see in the Bible was still current. Like there, we still needed to do sacrifices today. What would that look like? Would you go buy like the finest sacrificial meat at Costco and bring it home and like turn your oven onto clean, you know, because it's the really, really, really hot and it'll just like turn it into ash. Or maybe you'd have like special, like outside a special altar section and we would all burn hunks of meat, but they, they just choice meat, you know. And if you're rich, you'd, you'd buy more expensive meat. But, you know, people that aren't quite rich, they would buy pretty expensive meat. But, you know, it'd be... And by the way, Costco in this case, you know, Kirkland is actually owned by a church. I mean, this is... <laughs> they're making money on this, right? Like, this is... It's like the holy water thing. It's like, yeah, buy this great hunk of meat. This is... This is there no blemishes, you know. This one has a bit of blemish, but if it's all you can afford, God will accept it, you know. If he knows you can accept more, you're going to get punished because your heart wasn't in the right place. You bought the piece of meat that wasn't as great, you know. And there's people starving in the world, but you're like, you know what? I have to buy this hunk of meat to sacrifice it to God because he needs this sacrifice. He needs blood and flesh burning. He needs that. Of course, we go, that's yeah, ridiculous. That's barbaric. But for some reason, the people from before now, uh, they needed to do that, and that makes sense. And killing something for our sa salvation makes sense. I mean, we're in such a, a, a time where it's so convenient to not have to kill anything in order to be redeemed and to say sorry. You know, you just go, oh, Jesus did that, and we're, you know. But think about just the idea of it, these brutal sacrifices. Why, when Noah got off the ark, did he have to burn some of the only animals that were there? You got to lose something. You got to kill something. It's because it's outrageous. It's mental. It's ancient. It doesn't make sense. Nobody would think that now. It'd be, it'd be so stupid to do that in this day and age. If you go, it's a waste. Why would anyone want that? But I just think that if you consider the actual reality of killing something to say, so we, it's pretty dramatic, it's pretty over the top. 
And I don't think anyone, any fundamentalist Christian would go, oh yeah, no, I would still do that. I can still, I could see, I could see that that would still be something that, yeah, no, it makes sense to have to do that. Anyway, this is a long episode, and uh, sorry about that, but it, it's a recap episode, and I just, uh, I guess I wanted to rant a little bit. Guys, if you have watched this whole episode, that's very brave of you. Um, if you haven't subscribed and you've watched this whole episode, that's crazy. Subscribe, okay? Please leave comments on these videos. That means a lot to me. Please like them, and uh, I appreciate everyone that watches. Anyway, uh, we'll see you next time, and uh, until then, have a great week. Oh.